I'm really happy to have you here today and I'm excited to have Devin. I've seen many of her presentations. She's been on CTV and she is like in demand out there for the career uh, strategist, career helper, uh, someone to help you along uh, wherever you are in your career. So welcome Devin for welcome and thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Aren't you kind? Um, I know, right? All the media, it's been a little bit nerve wracking. <laughs> um, so I'm actually going to put some slides up here. Um, let's get this bad boy started. Just a reminder to everybody, please put yourself on mute. Thank you. All right, um, so thank you so much for that lovely welcome. Um, of course, today we're gonna talk, be talking a little bit about career change. Um, I, I kind of wanted to start a little bit with my own career story um, and you'll see why as I get partway through. So I have one of those jobs, I'm a career development professional. I work with people to help them figure out what they wanna be when they grow up, um, how to best present themselves to an employer through their resume or job interview, whatever it may be. Um, and it's really common for me to get asked, how did you get into that? That's really interesting, that's really cool. Um, I actually started my career in environmental consulting, which is not at all the answer that people are expecting um, when I start talking about that. I did an undergraduate degree in geography, which I really, really loved. I found it was, it's very interdisciplinary uh, geography and no, I cannot name you all the world capitals. Um, but uh, as I got towards the end, I thought, I think I wanna be in the environmental field. I think that's where I see myself. I had no idea. Uh, I didn't have hard skills. I had no idea what, I would, <laughs> what type of work I would do. And I ended up in a graduate certificate program to um, give me a little bit more of that grounding in like environmental regulations and things like you know soil sampling and whatever else. So. I did some of that. I was hired by a small engineering firm in my hometown, hometown of Sarnia, and uh, they were a great company to cut my teeth a little bit and to have a first kind of grown-up job because they were small. Uh, everybody knew each other, really great team chemistry, lots of great expertise, um, and even though I was, you know, this shiny green <laughs> new graduate, they were very open to, you know, suggestions and ideas and that sort of thing. It's a great place to start, but my uh, clients who I worked with to bring them into reg, uh, compliance with air and noise regulations, they drove me bananas. I really, really hated the work. So I started thinking more towards stuff like environmental education or maybe doing you know, community outreach for a nonprofit or something along those lines. Um, again, I was pretty early in my career. I think I was about 25 at this point. So I really didn't know, um, I don't know. I didn't know how that was gonna flush out. So I decided going back to school would probably be the best move. I did another graduate certificate in communications and surprisingly did not get anywhere near the environmental industry after that. I actually ended up being hired by Skills Ontario, which promotes careers in the trades to Ontario youth. So I spent the next five or so years going into schools. I delivered thousands of presentations to students talking about what trades are, how careers unfold, what is the difference between different types of post-secondary education. And as I was doing this, I started to realize just how little information I had in high school where I was being expected to make these big career decisions. I was like, well, there's something not right here. There's a disconnect there. And from there, I moved into the community college system. I was first in recruiting and then in the career center. And again, then it was meeting with students and new graduates one-on-one -on -one and hearing a lot of I liked my program, but I don't know how this translates into work. I really enjoyed this particular aspect, but I don't think that the rest of it really fits me. And I don't know if I want to do this for a career and I don't really know what to do next. Um, and then I would get like seasoned alumni who would come back. They're in their forties because we offered service lifetime to alumni and saying, you know, I've gotten this far. I don't know if this is really it. I need to make a shift. I don't know what to do. Um, when, uh, when I first chatted with Monica a little bit about doing this session, it was funny because I had somewhere around there had just read an article about how over 50% of Americans are looking to make a career change when the pandemic ends. Um, and then I did a bit of digging and the stat for Canada was about 30% or more. 
people wanting to make a career change. Um, so this is something that is currently on a lot of people's minds and it's something that I have certainly worked with a lot in, in the capacity of the work that I do. So that was kind of how this webinar was born, but I think very often we just don't know how to do good career research. We don't know how to make these shifts. Um, and so this seemed like a great way to talk about some of this stuff um, and, you know, partly to help you understand, like everybody thinks in these sorts of ways, it's very common to think, well, I'm not really sure. I think I did everything wrong. I, I wish I could start over again. Um, those are really common feelings to have. So my goal today is to hit on three major areas. We're going to talk about how to find a job without wasting your time on the job boards, um, why you don't need a time machine <laughs> to get your career decisions right, uh, or really any decisions for that matter, um, how you can redesign your career path without going into you know, all this debt or starting over is something I hear a lot. My goal for you is that you feel a little bit more confident and a little bit less stressed about maybe making a move sometime soon and that you'll have some actionable steps and some actionable tips that you can take with you. Um, so yeah, we'll dive right in here. As I'm going through, if you have questions, um, just pop them in the chat and uh, I can address them as we go and I'll check in with you a couple of times along the way as well. So we're gonna start, of course, with find a new job without wasting your time on the job boards. So the first thing a lot of people do when they're looking for a new job is, you tell me, what's the first thing you do? I want a new job, what am I gonna do? Any takers? Monster. Monster. <laughs> Go on, monster. And uh, what's the other one? Indeed. Mm -hmm. Start right. surfing around there. The other route you might go is um, you might think there's, uh, yeah, online job search sites, or if there's an organization you want to work for, right? You go plunk yourself on their careers page and like blast out resumes to them for everything that's posted. <laughs> that happens a lot. Um, so let me share some uh, info for you. So LinkedIn, of course, they estimate this because they are uh, they're a networking site is what they do. But they estimate that as many as 85% of jobs are obtained through networking. Other sources, and they're all over the place, um, range anywhere from 60 to 75%. Of, I would say that's even like 40 to 75% of jobs are never posted publicly anywhere. So they might be posted to a job board, but it might be something internal that only like members of an association can reach or they're only internal to an organization. On top of that, if you go on Indeed, they actually have a stat rate on their homepage that says, we have 20, 250 million unique users every month, which matters to them because they make their money from the employers who post jobs to them. So when you put all that together as a job seeker, you have to imagine, that you're not gonna get much of a chance if like only 30% of available jobs are being posted on a site like Indeed and 250 million people are looking at the same postings, the odds are stacked against you. So um, in the career world, we refer to this as using the spray and pray method, method of, um, of career search, of job search, where you just like blast resumes out through job boards and through online portals and just hope for the best. And it's the least efficient way of finding a job. What you really want to be doing is networking. And networking is something that, it's a loaded word. People don't like it. It's um, for a lot of people, especially if you're introverted, you may be thinking like, oh my gosh, I can't even. Um, what's really nice, uh, a bit of a silver lining, I guess, in the pandemic is that uh, the face of networking is a bit different. We can't go to these large events where everybody's standing around in a ballroom and you know, you're awkwardly, munching on danishes while trying to figure out how to break into a conversation. That's not really what's happening now because we physically are not allowed to do that. So one of the keys to good networking is start in a place where you already have something in common with people and build it one conversation at a time. So a couple of ideas here, alumni association, any um, post-secondary institution that you have attended, even your high school might have an alumni association, but you're considered a member as a graduate. So they probably have opportunities available. Similarly, industry associations, professional associations, not only will they necessarily hold networking events or opportunities, they may also have some sort of mentorship opportunities available. And whether you are the mentor or the mentee, <laughs> um, that can be a great way to build relationships. LinkedIn, I guess, is sort of obvious. That's what they're built for. Um, and that search bar, I mean, you can search on job title, you can search on experience, you can search on 
um, schools people have gone to, you name it. Um, so you can always find people very specifically who have things in common with you or who, who are doing things that sound interesting. One a lot of people don't necessarily think of is something like meetup, meetup.com, where the groups that you're joining may have zero professional association whatsoever, right? You may join groups where, I don't know, maybe you're a trail runner, sort of there. Um, and if you're joining a group of other trail runners, the conversation may start with stuff like, you know, how long have you been doing this? Or how do you track your stats? Or, you know, have you ever traveled to other parts of the country or other parts of the world and done trail running? How, what was the experience like, whatever. But eventually you can shift that conversation into, what do you do for a living? How did you get there? <laughs> what kinds of skills do you use on the job? What do you like and not like? Um, the point here is to find the commonality to start. One of the simplest things you can do if you're looking for a career change, um, especially if you have an idea of where you'd like to go, is tell everybody you know. Now, maybe not literally everybody, um, you're probably not gonna go to your current boss and say, hey buddy, just so you know, not likely, but um, I do have a good story to, uh, to illustrate that that I'll get to in just a moment. The other side of networking I find people are challenged about is they feel this pressure to sound smart and to impress the people that they're meeting um, through networking conversations or if you are attending online events. And you don't want to think of it that way. The best approach to networking is to be curious. Ask questions about what they're doing. And when they tell you, it's, tell me more. That sounds really cool. Um, be just open and friendly and listen. And the funny thing is you may barely say anything, but when you leave that interaction, they're going to think you're the best conversationalist that they've ever met. The goal early on um, is to get a sense of what skills and uh, so hard skills and soft skills do they bring into the job? What is it that they use on a daily basis? And that will give you a sense of what you already have and where you have gaps that you need to somehow figure out how to fill, which we'll move into with the next section, uh, with another section later on. So be curious, ask lots of questions, be friendly, be open. Um, but the idea here is that you hopefully get some idea of what, um, what you already have that you can take with you and what you need to get. So I promised you a story about telling everybody that you're looking. Um, and this was a story a former supervisor told me, uh, which is kind of too bad she can't tell you the story because she's, you know, she's pretty funny. She was good at it. Um, so it was early in her career. Um, she got into one of these situations where the company she worked for got bought out. The new company brought in their own people and, um, you know, axed everybody who was there. And of course, she was on the wrong side of the chop. So she gets laid off um, at this point. I think she was in like her mid to late 20s, probably the first time she'd experienced something like this uh, and was just super grumpy about it, which who isn't when you're laid off? Of course, you get grumpy about it. It's not personal, but you take it personally. So she moped around at home for a couple of weeks. And finally, one of her friends was like, dude, you need to snap out of it. And of all the things in the world, she talked this friend talked my former supervisor into going to a Tupperware party to give you a sense of the timelines here. So talks her into this Tupperware party. It was in her own neighborhood, so she didn't have to, like she didn't drive, she decided to walk over. And the whole way over, she's like trying to, I don't know, trying to be like, you know, don't be such a grump, like you need to snap out of it. You gotta start looking for jobs. You can't be in this headspace, whatever, whatever. So she gets to the house, rings the doorbell, hostess opens the door and says, oh, hi, I'm hostess, nice to meet you. And my boss said, hi, I'm boss, nice to meet you too. Um, and hostess says, oh boss, I'm so glad you're here today. What do you do for a living? Of course, she's been grumpy for like the last two or three weeks about being laid off. And she said, she, when she told me the story, she's like, I don't know even what possessed me to do it, but something just kind of clunked into place in my head. And I was like, stop feeling sorry for yourself. And so she replied with, actually I'm between jobs right now. Um, my company was taken over, got laid off, but I worked in um, training and development. In the, in the HR department and I really enjoyed the work. And host just looks at her for a second and goes, my boss is looking for somebody exactly like you right now. And I was like, you are kidding me. She's like, no word of a lie. And so it was, um, uh, it was funny because I think they were pretty far in the hiring process. Like they were about to, I think they were choosing between a couple of people. They were about to make an offer. So she wasn't in time to kind of be part of the hiring process, but, she was invited in to have a conversation. 
And at the end of the conversation, the person she spoke with, the, the manager of this, um, of this department said, you know, unfortunately we're not really in a position to like, we're pretty far in our hiring, but you know, I have a colleague in another uh, organization that's looking for something similar. Let me give him a call. Can I pass him your resume? And that job she ended up getting. So when I say tell everyone <laughs> that you're looking, I mean, tell the person at the grocery store checking out your groceries. I mean, tell your grandmother, tell your kid, tell your friends, your friends' parents, your kids' friends' parents, tell everybody, because you honestly don't know who's connected to who. Um, and it's that's one of the wildest stories I've ever heard. It cracks me up. It's pretty funny. Any questions so far? I'll give you a second to type if you want to. It's definitely who you know. Definitely who you know. And it's a lot simpler than people think. That's kind of my point here. Okay, so I will keep trekking. Certainly if you have questions, feel free to type them in and we will get to them. You don't need a time machine to get your career decisions right. Um, and I think probably all of us have had that feeling at one time or another of if I'd only known then what I know now, right, I would have done it differently. I would have chosen a different program. I would have started my career somewhere else. Um, I have heard this countless times. My colleagues in the career development world have heard this countless times. Um, the good news is, since nobody seems to have invented a time machine that they want to share with the world, um, you don't need that anyway. So the way career development works is not kind of these traditional analogies that we use. It's not a staircase. It's not a ladder. It's not a path, you know, winding path through the forest or whatever, whatever analogy you've heard. Um, in the inside of the industry, when we talk about career development from this professional perspective, we talk about career development happening in circles or in cycles. So you have, um, you have a lot of different elements to it right? You start generally very broad with, well, what do I like? What am I good at? What would fit my personality? And eventually you end up at a very, very specific point. What skills and experience do I have that fit this particular opportunity? And how am I going to communicate that effectively to this employer? So this is stuff that, you know, it seems like it should be really linear, right? Start with know your value and work your way up to here or start in, start here and work your way to here. But we have in, intentionally created this as a circle. And so a lot of times when I talk about this with people, I will say, you know, think of it more like being on a merry-go-round. You know, you get on and you circle around a couple times, hopefully you don't barf on a merry-go-round. <laughs> this is a terrible analogy. Um, and then maybe you think, you know what, this sounds cool. I'm going to go try that. And you go off to the side. Some things you like, some things you don't. You hang on to what you like, let go of what you don't, and you hop back on the merry-go-round. Uh, a Ferris wheel might be another way to think of it. And every time you get off, you have more experience, you have more ideas, um, and you get a little bit closer to that more ideal fit. That is more typically how a career unfolds, right? You try different things and you keep what you like and you let go of what doesn't work for you. At least that's the hope. Um, you may find that your career maybe doesn't look like a circle. Maybe it looks like a triangle. Maybe it looks like a star. Maybe it's a an amorphous blob, whatever. But just because the shape of your career doesn't look like the shape of someone else's doesn't mean you did it wrong. And one of the things I say to pretty much everyone I work with is you can only do the best that you can with what you know at the time, right? And once you get more information, once you are introduced to something that makes more sense to you, then you can work with that. Um, but until you get exposed to that, you can only do what you can do, okay? Um, so a great story to illustrate this, um, of course I shared my career story, but my, uh, my friend Carrie Ann has, I think one of the most interesting career stories I've heard. And I feel like she demonstrates this idea of sort of gather different pieces and build on what you already have. Um, Carrie Ann grew up in Jamaica and, uh, in high school, really good at sciences. She's one of the smartest people I've ever met and decided she wanted to become a doctor. So little 17 year old Carrie Ann is in the top box here going, yep, there's my goal, doctor, I'm on it. Starts in biology. And before she reached the end of first year, she was like, wow, there's like a lot of blood in being a doctor. I don't want to do that. So she's already changed her mind once. 
And instead of saying, oh my gosh, I have to start over. I don't know what to do. She went, you know what? I still like biology. I'm just going to stick with it and see what happens. So she continues on, graduated. The first job she took, it was in like reception or something that not even remotely related to what she studied and something she kind of hated a lot. Um, and one day she saw a recruitment flyer for the Army Reserve. So she went, sure, let's do that. And went through her basic training and the, the assignments she had to do. When she was um, through her required uh, commitment to the Army Reserve, she actually got a job teaching high school biology. And she really, really liked that, but the salary wasn't great. And I mean, especially when you're younger, uh, you're kind of thinking, I'm gonna make a lot of money as fast as possible, right? So kind of kept her eyes open for something else. A game changer for her was when she was 23, she met somebody who had just come into the country and he was looking at starting up uh, like a food processing, food production facility. And the whole idea was new to her. She really loved and was interested in technology. She really liked biology, even if it wasn't you know, medical in nature. Um, and so through conversations with this person, she decided she would go work for him um, and do this. And what really sparked for her was an interest in business. Cause of course now she's part of this company that's in startup mode. So she got to find out all these different things about how a business operates, how it gets off the ground, you know, your marketing, your accounting, your all these things that you need to do. So while she was working there, she started doing an MBA part-time. Biology to an MBA, not, not the logical <laughs> choice that you uh, expect. Um, and after about four years there, you know, working away and then working on school in her, in her spare time, uh, she was actually headhunted into a private security firm. They were looking for someone who had a woman who had leadership experience in the military. She was kind of a perfect fit. Um, and probably the best thing about that opportunity is that's where she met her husband, um, who was from Canada and was kind of working there on a contract. So after contracts were done, um, he decided he wanted to move back to Canada. She decided, yes, okay, I don't, sure, I'll leave paradise to go to the snow, that's fine. Um, and, uh, you know, they moved back here, got married, had a son, all that stuff. Um, obviously there are limitations on what she can do in terms of like visa and whatnot. She decided to go back to school again. So this time she enrolled an advanced diploma program in biomedical technology, which is basically the people who, um, service and build, you know, stuff like incubators, EKG machines, those kinds of things. Um, and that's where I met her because she attended that program at the college I worked at. Um, so, and we were working on a marketing thing together. So, um, when she graduated, she started working full time for the company that she'd done her field placement at. And at that point decided to finish her MBA, which had been sitting there at this point for like eight years. Um, so finished the MBA working along life got in the way. Uh, her mother fell ill and unfortunately passed away. And Carrie Ann ended up taking a, a good long leave of absence to, I mean, care for her mother and grieve losing her, but also it's one of those times when you, you sort of reassess, what do I really want out of life? Um, she decided that instead of going back to work for somebody else, she wanted to start her own business. So Carrie Ann owns a medical supply company uh, now, and she is also working on her PhD dissertation. Um, <laughs> and, you know, when she said she was doing a PhD, I was like, why am I not surprised? I feel like she's, a, her actual reality is a very good example of the bottom picture but she's also somebody who is very good at, I'm gonna hang on to what I like, get rid of what's not interesting to me and just keep building stuff I like on top of this. Um, and I mean, who knows where she'll go next? <laughs> who knows what it'll look like? I'm sure the pandemic has had some interesting impacts on her, but um, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the interesting thing in this is just, you know, you just keep gravitating towards the thing you like She's had some pretty big career changes, right? Doctor to business owner, PhD, all this stuff. But it wasn't like she did one drastic thing that changed everything. She just kept kind of building blocks on top of each other. Any questions at this point? I take a little sip. Alrighty, I will continue on. Redesign your career path without going into debt. <laughs> um, I've had this conversation with a lot of career folks that I know. Um, I have a pretty big network in the industry. And um, one thing we commonly, commonly hear 
is people, no matter what age, what stage of career, will often go to a career professional and say, I definitely want to change. I think what I need to do is go back to school. I need an MBA. I need a master's degree. I need to upgrade my diploma to a degree. I need, I need, I need. And um, usually after you talk to somebody who's like, well, what about this? What about that? You kind of pull back from that a little bit. What I'm saying here is very often you probably don't need drastic change. And there's a few things you want to bear in mind if this is kind of where you feel a pull right now. Uh, when somebody says this to me in my head, this is what I'm thinking. Do you really need an MBA? MBAs are expensive, by the way, really expensive. Do you? Um, do you want to think about what is the actual cost? Not just money, that's one piece, but how much time and energy do you need to invest in this? And is it going to be worth it to you? What happens if you don't get the outcome that you expected to get? And not just maybe you don't get that promotion or maybe you aren't as eligible for that job as you thought you might be. What happens if you get one semester into it and you go, wow, I really hate this. Then what? Is there an alternative? And yes, there is pretty much always an alternative. Um, so you remember early on, we talked about networking conversations. And one of the early things you want to do here is assess the gaps. Where is that gap? What do you actually need to get you from point A to point B? You may need a master's degree, and that's fine, right? If you decide tomorrow you want to be a lawyer, yeah, you're going to have to go to law school. That's part of the package. Um, but depending on what you want to do, that may not be necessary. So here are some alternatives to consider. You heard me mention that I did two graduate certificate programs, um, and those are short. Um, so most colleges and universities offer them. You typically have to have some previous education in order to get in, which is what makes it graduate studies. Um, but it's a certificate, so it's typically about eight months. Um, and obviously that's a lot quicker than taking two or three years to do an MBA or a master's or a PhD or whatever. So that might be an option. If you really have to completely reverse, completely change gears, that might be an option. Part-time studies um, or continuing education, you'll see them uh, listed as both at different educational institutions. So if you're looking to do a college route, a university route, what is available for you to study on a part-time basis? One of the other silver linings that has come out of the pandemic is the accessibility to online education. Um, where a couple of years ago, you may not have had much choice in doing courses part-time. Um, you might've had to attend in person and there maybe was no online option. Now that they all have the infrastructure in place, there's a really good chance you'll be able to find what you need online. Micro-credentials. Uh, literally what it sounds like, instead of getting you know, a diploma, a degree or whatever, you're getting a mini credential, it's a little guy. Um, usually it's about two or three courses and it's very targeted to a specific skill set for a specific industry. Um, so one example is, you know, medical record keeping if you work in, uh, in the medical field or something along the lines of different types of software that you might learn for any number of things, maybe architecture, maybe graphic design, whatever, but a mini credential that says, you know, this person is now skilled, they're qualified to do this. Professional designations or certifications. Um, obviously these, comes in, these come in a lot of shapes and sizes. Um, and I'm thinking of stuff like, you know, your Six Sigma lean belt kind of stuff. Um, project management certification can be really useful for a lot of different things. Um, I know in my field in career development, certification is optional, but if you have no introduction to the industry, I mean, most people, uh, I think I mentioned, come in from HR or come in from social work. If you haven't come from that background, there are other ways to become certified without having to go do, you know, an MSW or even a social services worker designation diploma at a college. So a lot of different ways sometimes to get where you want to go. And again, you're looking at where are you starting and where do you need to be and what is going to help you fill that gap. As you're looking along these lines, you want to be mindful too of how you can pay for it that doesn't necessarily have to come out of your pocket. Um, so scholarships, bursaries, student awards, um, we think of these things for high school kids, but there are tons of them out there. Very often what's offered by colleges and universities will be geared towards students who are coming from high school um, or maybe students who are already in, uh, in their studies, but there's a wide range of organizations out there that give money to all types of individuals for 
as many reasons as you can possibly imagine to get into whatever educational programs. The other route you might want to go is employer funding support. Um, I got my master's degree, oh my gosh, it was two and a half years ago. Um, and fortunately, I was able to uh, not have to deal with too many parameters on it. They got a little bit smart after they started offering stuff, but uh, my employer paid for almost half of the degree for me. I still had to pay a big chunk of money. Master's degrees are not cheap, but it was, um, it was a huge help. And because it was my employer putting it out, they basically took a little bit off my paycheck. So it was like I barely noticed the difference, which was really nice. So if you do need to do a big program, if you do need to do a big shift, think about ways you can pay for it that don't mean it has to come out of pocket or that you can do it incrementally so that it's not one big shot. Any questions about that stuff? I should mention here too, there's in a lot of cases, schools are getting really creative about how they let people into programs. Um, so the master's program that I did, you know, I have maybe the more traditional, like I have an undergraduate degree, I had done some other stuff, plus I had a lot of work experience, but two of my former colleagues were in the same program and both of them only had college diplomas and they were able to get into a master's program, complete a master's program while they were working full time. Um, so if you're not sure about admission, you might be surprised at what you find too, if you need to go that route. Devin, I had a question. Yeah. What is, um, what's the best way, like all these alternative approaches are great, but what is the best way other than just Googling <laughs> how to find out where to find out if there is a program that you might be interested in? Like, is that, I guess that's probably something a career coach could help you with. But where, where do you even start and to find out what programs are out there? Because I know <clears> education has, if this is like your second career, if you're right out of school, you kind of know probably a little bit more about uh, what uh, courses are out there and graduate certificate programs, part-time continuing education. But it can be quite overwhelming just to <clears> figure out where to even look and how to navigate all that information. It can, for sure. Um, so you're right, yes, yeah, someone like me can be really helpful for that. Um, the uh, If you're laying the groundwork with your networking, that should give you some ideas, right? Even if you're just looking people up on LinkedIn and you go and see like, what certifications do they have? What education have they done? Um, that will help give you an idea of where to start. The other route to go um, is take a look on different course platforms that exist and now there's a lot of them. Um, so look at something like a LinkedIn learning because very often they'll have, like when I sign into LinkedIn, there's a little bar at the side that says, here are the popular courses this week. Here are the popular courses with people right now. And it's like, oh, I wonder why people are doing that. What's getting them interested? Um, and you'll find similar stuff on like Coursera, Udemy, those kinds of things. I had a question, um, Devin, when you're talking about employer funding support. Yes. Do you find with um, the past year with the pandemic that employers are perhaps now adding more courses that their employees can take in order to, to maybe keep them and make them more beneficial all around as an employee? Because of the accessibility of a lot of online platforms, um, a lot of employers are doing stuff like purchasing a subscription to something like LinkedIn Learning. And so you can access that as long as you're linked to the employer. There's this whole thing. Um, I've actually never figured out how to unlink from my previous employer, so I can't confirm for them that I still work there, but I can't figure out how to not be connected to them anymore. Um, but there's a way to do it. So a lot of them are offering it that way, or they'll do similar stuff with other types of platforms where it's you know, you have access to this particular type of platform and it may be something general. It also may be something very specific. So like, I know my spouse has access to certain learning platforms that are specific to IT because that's his industry. Um, and that's something that we're seeing a lot more employers doing. They aren't necessarily holding that training on site. They're not necessarily bringing people in or hiring people to do that, but they are offering access to these platforms to their employees. That's a really good point. Okay, so we touched on uh, the highlight reel. Um, there's just a couple other things I want to mention. So one is, what does this actual process look like? So what we looked at today was beginning to do some quality career research, talk to people who do what you wanna do and figure out how to make them move. 
Where do you need to upskill? Where do you need to retrain? Then you want to get targeted about, okay, so I know what I want to do. I know how I'm going to fill in those gaps for me. Now, what employers do I target? How do I target them? Who do I want to talk to? How do I get really specific about this? How can I be more effective with my networking? Not just to find out about careers, but now to find out about the hidden job market, tap into those opportunities that are being posted. Uh, ensuring your resume and your cover letter are as updated and shiny as possible to make you put your best foot forward. And of course, being ready for the job interview process, which depending on your career journey may be very different. A lot of things have changed in the pandemic when it comes to job interviews. Um, we're seeing more in terms of phone screenings um, or asynchronous video screenings being done before you invest in an actual interview. Um, a lot of companies are also moving to a sort of a skill demonstration before they invite you for an interview. Um, so they may have you work on a case study or they may have you um, record a presentation about something in particular before they even bring you in for an interview. Um, that's become more popular as well. Um, so if you're feeling like super intimidated <laughs> about this process, um, I've cleared a few spaces in my calendar over the next few days to um, so people can book a 30 minute call just to go, okay, what's your specific situation? What would I suggest in terms of where you start so that you can, uh, you can be more specific about what you're doing. Um, and Mitch, Monica, one of you, I know you have the links. So if you can pop that in the chat, that would be great. Um, just click on there and pick a time. Um, yeah, the guy, the idea here is to ensure that you're, on track that you're, you know, heading in the right direction, steering, you know, putting the cart in the right way so that you're, uh, you're headed the right way you want to go. Um, and this is a, a free complimentary 30 minute call. One last thing that I want to, um, that I do want to touch on is uh, a lot of people that I talk to, once I have these conversations with people, they're like, how am I going to find the time to do this? Are you kidding me right now? Um, and so I want to share one last little a little time hack for you. Um, so every week has 168 hours in it. Everybody's week is exactly the same, 168 hours. You can divide 168 into three buckets of 56 hours each. Um, so what do you do with three buckets of 56 hours? Well, the first bucket is sleep. Um, apparently, you're supposed to sleep eight hours a night. Whether you do or not is a totally different thing. But most of the experts say seven to eight hours is about ideal. Eight times seven is 56 hours. If you sleep a little bit less than that and you still feel rested, then you're a little bit ahead of the game. The second bucket, traditionally we would say is work. Um, that's kind of got pretty messed up <laughs> in this whole pandemic situation um, that, you know, some people are finding very difficult to manage work-life balance, right? When your workspace is right where you also eat and watch TV and anything else, it's easy to just keep working. Um, but 56 hours, you know, maybe that's a good, uh, a good benchmark for whether or not you're on track. And traditionally that would include like your commuting time to work as well. Um, and obviously many, many fewer people are commuting right now than normally would be. So that leaves you with 56 more hours. You have a whole 56 hours in the week where you're not sleeping, you're not working, and that's where you fit everything else. Um, obviously that's gonna include some stuff you have to do, right? You have to eat, you have to shower, you have to probably clean the house sometimes, you know, things like that fit in there, but that's also where you spend time like Netflix, social media, Zooming with friends, going for walks, you know, doing those kinds of things that all fits into that last bucket. Um, so if you're not sure that you have time to do this, what I would suggest is anytime you are not, so you know what, track your work time too, but anytime you're not sleeping and you're not working, track your time. What are you doing? And what could you ax in order to do stuff like pick up an, extra, an additional course, engage in some networking conversations, brush up your resume, um, what other things could you do or could you be doing to help out with that and start moving, start using that time in a way that, that fits you a bit better. That's my little time hack for my, my good friend, Neil Pazrita. What, <laughs> I don't know, Charlotte, what have you been doing with your 56 hours? <laughs> um, so that brings me to the end of my presentation. If there are any other questions, uh, we still have a few minutes, so please feel free to throw them in there. Um, comments, jokes, I always like jokes. Um, 
the, the daddier the jokes, the better. Um, but yeah, you know, there's, you can do this. You don't have to do massive stuff. It's really about small changes and being committed to them. Thanks so much, Devin. That was amazing. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or just unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did have one question because I think you mentioned like LinkedIn is so powerful. Mm -hmm. What would you say that be, uh, before you start linking in with people, if you're looking for a job, what are your tips to like, how should you get ready? I mean, obviously I think you should probably update your profile and mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, but a lot of people don't really know how to make their LinkedIn profile the best it can be. Is that something you can help out with or what, what are your suggestions to get your LinkedIn where it should be? Um, I definitely kind of, if you have worries about, um, a LinkedIn, what your LinkedIn looks like, we can do, uh, we can do like sort of an audit, but, um, a couple things I suggest off the top, uh, one is take a look at your headline. Um, so your headline is what comes right under your name or right after your name, um, because when you post stuff or when you comment on somebody's stuff, at least a bit of your headline shows up with your name. So whatever your top skills are that you have to offer, um, whatever industry you're in, uh, what problems do you solve, that stuff should be right at the beginning of your headline, because every time you comment on somebody's stuff, people are going to see your name and then I help people too, or my goal in life is to, or the industry I'm most experienced in is, or like that goes right along with, with your name. Um, so that's just a little tweaky markety thing. Um, the other thing you want to do is create a good about section. Uh, and a lot of people actually skip the about section, but LinkedIn comes up really, really high in Google searches. So you want to make sure if somebody's looking up your name or somebody who's in there looking you up because they've met you somewhere, your LinkedIn is going to come up really high and that about section um, gives people a kind of a baseline of who you are. So you want to think of it sort of like um, maybe how you would do like an elevator pitch, right? These are the, this is what I do. This is what I love. This is why I'm good at it. Um, this is who I like to help. Is it right? You can expand on what you put in your headline. Your headline may limit you in characters, um, but that's usually the stuff people look at fastest. Um, and then in terms of like the rest of your profile, I mean, it's really up to you. The biggest, uh, what you want to include, what you don't want to include, what you want strangers to see, what you want connections to see. Um, the best tip I can give you is as you're filling out your profile, think of it in terms of forward thinking. Not so much what you've done in the past, but how the next person will benefit from what you've done in the past. Oh, that's good. Um, so that's really the direction you want to go. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, one other quick LinkedIn question. Yeah. Um, obviously, I'm not looking for a job right now, but I'm asking <laughs> all these questions on behalf of my uh, teenagers who will one day be <laughs> taking jobs. But when do you think um, is a good time for somebody to create a LinkedIn page? Um, I would say definitely do it as a high schooler. Um, I'm probably not gonna be able to find the link, but uh, I can send it, uh, Monica, you're, you're gonna send it the slides after, I can send you a link. There's actually a course on LinkedIn you can do. That's a, you know, LinkedIn for first timers, LinkedIn for like, as you're a student, how to build up. Um, I always suggest doing that because it's such a great research tool. When they start looking at what kinds of careers they wanna pursue, when they start looking at programs they want to get into, it's gonna be a great way for them to see, okay, so, alumni from that program, what are they actually doing? Do they even work in the field? Um, but LinkedIn limits how many searches you can do based on how many connections you have. So if they can start, yeah. So if they can start when they're younger to create the profile and start even just linking with like you and other family members and like people you know, whatever, it at least increases their, uh, their opportunities to find out more. And that, on that same note, that would be a really great way for a student to get a teacher to put a recommendation yep. on their LinkedIn profile, because a lot of times they're too nervous or too shy, but yeah. they could always connect with their teacher uh, through mm -hmm. a message and say, I'd, you know, especially if they've got a good connection with them on about a project that they've done or whatever, because that mm -hmm. always, that always helps as I told my kids the same. Yeah, for sure. And not just teachers, right? Coaches, um, other type, like not just school teachers, but like other types of teachers. So if they take some kind of lessons, um, whatever it is, that's always a great way to get started too.